occasion to read through Jeremiah in my personal devotions, and uh, the Lord just laid it on my heart to, uh, to pick out a few passages and, and share some things. Uh, it's the Old Testament, New Testament, a bit different, and uh, Jeremiah, man, what a, what a man he was. I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven. He, he really endured. Uh, he had a hard time, and uh, you know what a, what a blessing he was to his nation, even though they didn't appreciate him. Uh, the name of my sermon this morning, you don't care about this, but it's Prone to Wander. <laughs> prone to Wander. Um, there's, a, there's a song that we used to sing, prone, prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It. Prone to Leave the God I Love. Yeah, and that's, that's a pretty good description of what Israel, or really we're talking now about Judah, were like in the time we're talking about here. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, you know that name? He was the king of Babylon. He, he'd removed J Judah's last king. I, I think it's interesting that the last king's name started with Z. <laughs> Zedekiah, he was the last king of Judah. And if you know the story, I mean, uh, very cruel. They, they killed Zedekiah's sons while he watched, and then they blinded him. Man, that, that's, a, that's a pretty, pretty rough. Then they appointed a governor named Gedaliah as a caretaker, a Jewish man to be pretty much the governor over Judah. Well, some of the, the Jews, Ishmael and his followers, murdered Gedaliah. Uh, some of the people told Gedaliah, they said, Ishmael's up to no good. Oh, he'll, he'll be right. <laughs> well, Ishmael came and, and with his men killed Gedaliah. And then they got all the people together and they were ready to flee to Egypt. They had decided that that's where they would find safety. Look at uh, chapter 41, uh, verse 17. This is just by way of introduction. It says, They departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimam, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. Because the Chaldeans, uh, I'm sorry, because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael the son of Nethani had slain Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. So here's, here's the situation. They've gone against the, the rulers of their country, who've taken over their country. They're, they're, ready, they're, they're ready to go to Egypt because they think that's where they'll be safe. And it's at this point they decide, maybe we should stop and see what God wants us to do. Have you ever done that? You've got all your plans made and then you think, Oh, maybe I should see what God wants. <laughs> and you ask God to bless what you've already decided you're going to do, and you're going to do whether he wants you to or not. Uh, well, that's pretty much what Judah was, was doing here. And so they go to Jeremiah. They knew that Jeremiah was a man of God. He was a prophet. Uh, let's read Jeremiah 42, starting in verse 1. I'll just read the first three verses. It says, Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Kareah, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshea, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee our supplication be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? They sound really spiritual. Now, you'll hear people sometimes who will sound really spiritual. But you know, Jeremiah does pray. Uh, I, I have that happen. People will ask me things, and I, I think sometimes they don't expect me to respond, and, and I try to, to, to follow through, you know, pray for them, do the thing that they've asked. Well, Jeremiah did what they asked. He prayed. Verse 7, It came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. He prayed, and God gave him an answer. Here's God's answer. and Let's look in verse 9. And, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then, I, then will I build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up, for I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand, and I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercies upon you, and cause you to return to your own land. So God's answer to them is, stay where you are. Don't go to Egypt. If you'll stay, I'll bless you. I'll protect you. 
Uh, that is God's will for your life. Now, I'm not going to read all of 13 through 18, but he also spells out for them what will happen if they go to Egypt. And he lays it out pretty clearly. If you go to Egypt, uh, you'll, you'll have trouble. Well, they decide that they're going to go to Egypt anyway. Uh, that's what I was mentioning before. Yeah, there's times in our lives when we pray, and we have no intention of doing what God wants us to do if it's different than what we've already planned. And we'll even say, you know, let's ask the Lord to bless what we're going to do here. <laughs> uh, but they had particularly gone to God to ask Him what He wanted them to do. And God specifically spoke to them and showed them what He wanted them to do. In chapter 43, verse 1, listen to their response. It came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Jehonan the son of Kareah, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. <laughs> uh, but Barak the son of Neriah setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captive into Babylon. So they say, pray for us. See what God wants us to do. He prays. God gives them an answer. They say, that's, that's not what God wants us to do. Have you ever had that happen where you share God's word with people and they say, I don't believe that? It happens a lot, doesn't it? Uh, and, and you know, it, one of the interesting things is that before they said this, God said they would say that. <laughs> In uh, chapter 42, verses 19 and 20. Now, the Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day, for ye dissemble in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God. See, God knew that they, they weren't being honest. God was admonishing them. That word admonish basically means He told them clearly and plainly again and again. Uh, you parents know what that word means. <laughs> you know, I told you, <laughs> you've told him specifically, you've told him clearly, you've told him again and again. God had admonished Judah, but Judah was dissembling. Uh, that just means they weren't listening. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't really being honest about uh, their relationship with the God. They didn't really want to hear what God had to say. It's kind of like what God says in 2 Timothy when he says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to the, themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be, shall be turned unto fables. Uh, sa same kind of a thing, where people are hearing the sound, but they're not listening. Uh, they're not listening to the Lord. And the reason behind this decision is, is what we, I want us to look at this morning. And, and it's so simple. Have you ever heard the... The trio, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's exactly what was affecting Judah. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, that's been, in my Bible it lists it as being 588 B.C. I don't know if that's exactly right. Uh, 588 B.C. That's been a long time ago. Isn't it amazing? As much as things change, they really stay pretty much the same. <laughs> the same thing that's making people disobey God then is what is making people disobey God now. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And as, as we look at this this morning, the important thing is not just to see what they did. It's to see how can we do different? How can we be a, a godly people? You know, the Bible often uses Egypt as a type of the world, a picture of the world. If you study scripture, you know that. And oftentimes Israel would say, let's go to Egypt. And they would go there for safety or they would go there for, for some uh, cultural or, or uh, physical reason. Judah thought that Egypt would provide security. Uh, in chapter 42, verse 13, he says, But if ye say, We will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. They thought if they could go to Egypt, they'd be safe. Uh, there's people today who think, Man, if I could get to Australia, I'd be safe. If I could go to Canada or America, I'd be safe. And their trust is in the world. Israel regularly did this. Let me read you, just, just listen to this. This is Isaiah, uh, another prophet. 
He says in Isaiah 31, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because there are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. See, they were looking to the world. And uh, that's, that's not where our help is. They're also looking to the flesh. Did you notice as we read in chapter 43, verse 2, God labeled them all the proud men? You probably saw that as we read past there. All the proud men. You know, pride is when we trust ourselves. They'd ask God what, he, what they should do. And when God told them they were so proud, they wouldn't even listen. I've had it happen where you, you tell somebody exactly what they need to hear, but they, they already know. And they go mess up their life with the, the wrong answer. Uh, I, I know mechanics probably get that. You know, where they tell somebody how to fix something. Oh, no, we'll do it a different way. Uh, but, you know, in spiritual things, it's even more important. They were trusting themselves. That's pride. But you know, the main problem, and this is exposed as we get into chapter 44, is that they didn't worship God. It wasn't just the world and the flesh. It was the devil. <laughs> it was that they were not listening to God. Uh, God shows that they're into false religion. And, and let me tell you, the, de the devil is the author of, of religion. If you want a religion, he's got one for you. He's got hundreds of them. He'll satisfy whatever you want. But if you want God, you've got to go to God. In uh, chapter 44, uh, at the, in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Ye have seen all the evil that I've brought upon Jerusalem. He's telling them, you've, you've seen all the trouble, all the, all the results of, of how you're living here. Now, verse 3, Because of their wickedness, which they've committed to provoke me to anger, and that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. He said, you've been worshiping false gods. If you go to uh, verse 15, he spells it out more specifically. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros answered Jeremiah saying, this, this is after they've already taken him to, to Egypt. As for the word that thou hast spoken to, unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we've done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah, and the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well, and saw no evil. Wow. They're, they're not only worshiping false gods, they're saying worshiping God, the real God, just causes us trouble. Uh, the queen of heaven, you heard that expression before? Uh, there's religion still used that. And it's the same devil worship that it was uh, back in these days. Uh, much like today, uh, the queen of heaven they were talking about was Ashtoreth or Astarte. Uh, it was a, a goddess of fertility, a worship that involved sexual immorality. Boy, that sounds just like what's in the news, isn't it? Uh, worship of sex. Uh, identifying by uh, your sexual perversion. Uh, false religions still pray to the queen of heaven. This wasn't just a, a, a little bit of idolatry. Uh, this was, they were really into it. And uh, they resented God interfering. And they blamed worshiping God for their failure. He mentions it there in, in uh, verse 17, but then verse 18. For since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven... And to pour out drink offerings unto her, we've won at all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. For when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Uh, the women are saying, these men knew what was going on. Uh, they're a part of it too. And uh, they, were, they were worshiping false gods. And Judah failed because it abandoned God. Now all of those were part of it. The world, the flesh, and, and the devil. Chapter 44, verse 23, he says, Because you've burned incense and because you've sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord nor walked in His law nor in His statutes nor in His testimonies, therefore this evil has happened unto you as at this day. God very specifically tells him, Because you've abandoned worshiping the Lord, trusting the Lord, that's why you're in the fix 
that you're in now. You know, as we look around our world, uh, our world's in trouble. A and it's because we've, we've left off worshiping the Lord. You know, the worship of the Lord, it's, it's weird. As you look in history, it kind of moves from continent to continent where you know, people honor the Lord. And, and I, I don't know where it's going now, but uh, I guess Christians are going to be going up pretty soon. Uh, you know, we, we can worship the Lord. And uh, yet, even as Christians, when we're in a nation that is not worshiping the Lord, we're going to be in trouble. We talked about that with, with Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah was a man of God, and yet he was in trouble because his nation was not godly. And, and when he prayed, he, you know, he prayed as part of them. And, you know, we're, we're a part of a bigger group than ourselves. We're not just individuals. As individuals, we need to do right. We need to trust the Lord. We need to worship the Lord. But, you know, you're a part of a church. You're part of a community. You're part of a country. We need to have a concern for those around us. That was Jeremiah in his day. Uh, we need to be people of God. You, you know, we can learn from this. Uh, what can we do? Well, number one, we can humble ourselves. You know, the Bible talks about humbling ourselves and, and praying. In, uh, in that passage, you talk about all those, those proud men. You, you know, pride is a real problem. In our world, you, you ask young people today about pride, and, and every one of them will think it's a good thing. They'll wear shirts, pride, you know, about this and that. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go off into that subject, but it, it really has to do with just satisfying our flesh. And satisfying our flesh is not the answer. Just living for happiness. You, you know, the average person today is just living to be happy. It doesn't matter how it affects anyone else. We just want to be happy. We just want our children to be happy. We just want our world to be happy. Well, that's not the answer, being happy. The Bible tells us we need to humble ourselves. In Proverbs, he says, Pride uh, cometh before destruction and, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Pride leads to, to a fall. Tur turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. He gives us some great instruction here regarding humility. Our son had a t-shirt made that says, Death to Self. He said it really makes people nervous when they see that. <laughs> Most people would have no idea what it's, what it's talking about. But you know, pride is, is a terrible thing. Pride is what caused Adam and Eve and, and, and Satan and uh, caused the beginning of the whole mess. And as, even as Christians, we, we struggle with it. I've struggled with it in this service already. I won't tell you when, but anyway... Um, in, uh, where am I here? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, he says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now we often use that verse 7, but we don't always see the connection to humility. You know, we, we like the idea of casting all our care upon Him. Well, what that starts with is humbling ourselves before the Lord. I love how he phrases it, be clothed with humility. We need the Lord's help to do that, to be clothed with humility. It's a constant battle. It's going to come up in your home. It's going to come up in your mind. It's going to come up at church. It's going to come up at work. It's going to come up as you drive along the road. <laughs> I mean, it's a constant battle. I know. <laughs> and so do you. Be clothed with humility. In verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And here's the, the clincher, that he may exalt you in due time. See, we promote ourselves all the time. The world tells us to do that. God says, humble yourself. Let him exalt you. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Give your cares to him. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? But pride makes it so hard. I came across a verse as I was thinking about it this morning, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Is that true? Should be. Our confidence is not in the flesh, it's not in pride, it's in humility. And part of that humility is our priority. Who's going to take first place? 
You or the Lord? Part of that is our obedience to the Lord. You're going to do what God says or what you want to do? You're going to be like Judah where they say, God, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to do this? <laughs> well, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> uh, do you, is, that, is that humility? No. That's pride. We have to humble ourselves. Secondly, we need to live by faith. We, we don't want to look to Egypt for our, our help. And you can apply that in a lot of ways. But remember, Egypt is a, is a type of the world. God wants us to look to Him. You, you know, there's so many things in life where we think, oh, you know, the government needs to do this. Well, listen, our hope's not in the government. Thank the Lord for that. Now, we need to be good citizens. But that's not our hope. Uh, surely the doctor has a pill for that. Well, our hope is not in the doctors. And that's not the answer. Well, let's just go down to the bank and we'll, we'll get a loan. Listen, our, our hope is not in the banks. Uh, we have some magazines we read about the Depression. They're about history. And over and over you hear the testimony of people who put their money in the bank one day and the bank closed that day and they never saw their money again. That could happen here just and now just as much. Uh, a lot of people try to fit into their culture. That's not our hope. The, the natural inclination is to go to Egypt, to go to the world, to fit in, to have, the, to have our hope there. But a spiritual response is different. It, it makes me think of 1 John chapter 2, where God says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, he says, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not of the Father but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And we need to live by faith. Faith in, in the Lord. A spiritual response is different than a natural response. A lot of times in your life, you're going to have a natural response. Get past it and go to the spiritual response. <laughs> uh, you know, you're going to have that initial pride reaction. Get past it. Humble yourself and, and live by faith. And God can use you and God can bless you. Where does faith come from? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's not some secret pocket in, in, inside of you. It's the Word of God. Live by God's Word. God tells us we need to humble ourselves. We need to live by faith. And then thirdly, we need to love the Lord. You know, when they were worshiping false gods, it's because they didn't love the Lord. Judah loved Ashtoreth. To us, that, that doesn't mean much. But the main thing is they didn't love the Lord. God had told them, and God tells us in the, in the Old Testament when He was talking about what we, how we need to live, He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Over and over in the Old Testament He told them that. And then Jesus in, in the New Testament said the same thing. Mark chapter 12 and, and verse 30. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Most important thing is to love the Lord. And you know, that really has to do with worshiping Him. I'm getting the impression that we live in kind of a worshipless world. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's just that we're worshiping ourselves. We're so busy worshiping ourselves, we have no, no worship left for anyone or anything else. But God tells us to worship Him. We need to understand that. In the very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, God says. There's a verse in Exodus 34 where he says, Thou shalt worship no other god for the Lord, listen to this, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now God is allowed to be jealous. He's allowed to say, you can't put anyone before me. Now I can't say that to you. You can't say that to me, but God can God is a jealous God. He deserves our worship. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of worship. He's the Lord. And he says to worship Him is to worship Him in holiness. It's not how we want to do it. It's how He wants us to do it. Psalm 29, 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I love that phrase. Jesus put it in a negative way in Mark 7 when he said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Worshiping the Lord is honoring his word. We don't want to honor our word above God's word. 
We want to honor God's Word. That's worship. Jesus said in John 4 that God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I love how God puts it in Hebrews chapter 13 when He says, it's Hebrews 13, 15, By Him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. You know, in worship you give sacrifices. In the Old Testament they, they sacrificed the, the various things. Well, God says as Christians we give the sacrifice of praise. That's worshiping Him. You know, many times we, we're quick to share the complaints. Boy, the Lord's complaint department is, is busy. <laughs> but the praise department, man, uh, you know, I think there's cobwebs going on that, on that door. Uh, we need to praise the Lord. We need to thank the Lord. It'll strengthen you. It'll help you. It'll bless the Lord. There's not much we can do to bless the Lord. That's, that's one of them. He says to offer the sacrifice of praise. In my Bible, I must have heard this as a sermon somewhere, I've written down four sacrifices. They all start with a P, so I know it must be a sermon. The first one's we offer the sacrifice of our person. That's Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God wants your body. God wants your person. That will honor Him. That will worship Him. In other places, He said, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. The other the second one is the sacrifice of our purse. I won't read it, but it's 2 Corinthians 8. You know, we give what the Lord has given to us. And as we give of our tithes and offerings, it's, it's worship to the Lord. Oftentimes in church, they'll say, you know, let's worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And it's true. And then this one, uh, Hebrews 13, 15, we, we offer the sacrifice of praise. What a blessing it is that we can praise the Lord. The next one is verse 16. To do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Our performance. To do good and to communicate. That word communicate is, is the Greek word koinonia. It's talking about our fellowship together as, as Christians. Uh, it worships the Lord to fellowship together as Christians and to be a blessing uh, to each other. It, it's a big subject, but we can love the Lord. We can worship the Lord. There's so many opportunities that we have. Uh, we have to start by humbling ourselves. Uh, we, we trust Him. We live by faith. Uh, we love the Lord. Listen, don't live for self. Don't live for pride. Uh, don't live for the world. There's a song about salvation, and, and the basic message is the world didn't give it to you, and the world can't take it away. Listen, you don't get saved by living for the world. You don't get satisfaction by living for the world. Live for the Lord. Eternity. And then love what he loves. You know, the Bible says that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The Bible says God loved the world. You know, he loves sinners. You know, as Christians, we need to love sinners. We need to care about them. We're, we're on their side. They're against themselves. That's what he talks about in Timothy. God loves us. And what a blessing it is that we can, we can love him because he first loved us. You don't have to hate yourself. That's what I'm saying. Just let the Lord love you. And we're commanded to love each other. This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. 1 John 4, 21. You know, as a nation, Judah loved and trusted all the wrong things. You've known people like that. You know, just everything they do is, is messed up. Maybe you've been a person like that. Listen, don't make their, their mistake. Now, don't live for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Humble yourself before the Lord. You know, the Bible says that one of the first areas we, where we need to humble ourselves is to admit, admit that we're sinners and need His forgiveness. The Bible says all have sinned. That's us. He says the wages of sin is death. But secondly, we need to trust the Lord. Humble ourselves, trust the Lord, live by faith. When he says the wages of sin is death, that verse goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a blessing that we can humbly come to Him and, and He'll forgive our sins and, and save our soul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He says, and thou shalt be saved. And with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God wants us to trust Him. And then we need to love Him. Give Him your whole heart. Don't hold back. Don't live for pride. Live for humility and faith and love the Lord. Let me encourage you. Do it today.
Don't put it off. God will give you plenty of opportunities to humble yourself. It, it comes up all the time. And let me encourage you to take that opportunity. Take each one. Humble yourself first before the Lord. And then as God gives you opportunity to, with those around you. Uh, the nation of Judah, they dissembled. Now, in most church services, you have people who are, are only there, well, they're not there honestly. I, I hope that's not true this morning. I hope you're not dissembling. I hope you're not just here culturally. I hope that you're here to trust the Lord. Be honest with, with the Lord. Uh, let Him search your heart. Live for Him. Give Him eternity. Someday you're going to stand before Him and give an account. And the main thing is, what have you done with Jesus Christ? God sent His Son, the best. God's Son did what needed to be done. He died for our sins and rose again. Put your trust in Him and then apply it to everyday living. Lord, what would you have me to do? Don't be like Judah where you ask Him and you know you're not going to do it. When God speaks, when you, when you know that God has spoken from His Word, uh, obey Him. Let me encourage you to come tonight. Right? We're going to be talking about this, this again in a different way. I only realized it this morning as I was going over my sermons, but uh, the Lord's just kind of worked that out. Uh, the conviction tonight has, has to do with this. All right, we're going to sing a song this morning, I Surrender All.